Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Um, today we will have the OKC colloquium given by uh, Dr. Benjamin Bowes. So besides being a good friend of mine, actually Ben did his PhD at the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation in Portsmouth, where he worked with Kazuya Koyama, testing modified gravity with the galaxy clustering. Then he did a postdoc at the Yukawa Institute of Theoretical Physics, holding the prestigious JSPS fellowship, and is at the moment a postdoc at the University of Geneva, working with tests of modified gravity and dark energy, also machine learning, and being part of Euclid. Finally, Ben is starting as a Hawking Fellow next year at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, today, he's going to be talking about the next big test for cosmology, which is exploring the nonlinear scale of structure formation. So please, Ben, the stage is yours. Thanks very much, Guilherme. Um, I'll jump straight in, uh, because I think there's a lot uh, I want to talk about today. So as my title says, I'm going to be talking about the next big test for the cosmological model, the standard cosmological model, which is Lambda CDM. And uh, that test, um, I'm going to argue, is going to be uh, using the nonlinear scales of cosmic structure formation. So when I say nonlinear, I mean the small physical scales of cosmic structure. OK. so. Uh, my talk will be divided into roughly three parts. So as usual in any cosmology talk or any talk in general, you want to motivate uh, the work that you've done. So I'll ask why do we need uh, to test the current model? So what are the current problems? Um, do we need new physics? And if uh, there is any new physics, uh, where can we find it? And I'll say that the nonlinear scales, the small scales of cosmic structure, are an as yet untested regime. And they could offer hints of new physics, which could be very useful in understanding nature at a deeper and more fundamental level. Uh, then I'll explain, it gets a bit more technical from there. So we'll go into how, how do we do that? How do we go from writing down a Lagrangian or some, some model of gravity or cosmology? all the way to the things that we look at, uh, the things that we observe in the sky. Uh, so I'll be describing that map uh, a bit in section two. And then finally, uh, even more technical, it's uh, after you've done this map, that's not the end of the story, you're gonna have a lot of, um, you know, additional phenomena going on, going on on these nonlinear scales, it's very messy. So the question then becomes, how do you disentangle cosmology and gravity from all these additional phenomena that you don't really care so much about, as cosmologists at least? Uh, and the stuff I'll be talking about, uh, I've done in collaboration with many, many people, and I list uh, some of them here, uh, but primarily Matteo Fataneo, who is now, uh, I believe, at the uh, University of Bonn or, or Heidelberg. But he was a, a long time postdoc at the University of Edinburgh. Okay, so let's jump in. So why, let's motivate uh, the problem. And uh, so this is maybe a bit of a long-winded motivation, but I'll, I'll go through it uh, quite quickly. I found it was quite useful for PhD students or people who are new to cosmology. Um, and also I found it interesting to write these slides. So we'll do a bit of history. So how did we get to where we are? How did we get to the current cosmological model? Uh, so if we go back 100 years, we had Einstein, he wrote down his theory of general relativity, and uh, there was his static universe, uh, which contained just matter, uh, and it was non-dynamical, uh, and he had to introduce this, this cosmological constant to keep uh, the, equation, the equations non-dynamic. Uh, so that was great. That was Einstein's uh, bias, you could say. He wanted things to, to remain uh, static. Uh, but then 10 years later, um, Hubble, uh, published his famous results showing that the recessional velocities of, of galaxies was proportional to the distance uh, these galaxies were away from us. And the simplest explanation for that was uh, a universe where the spatial part was expanding. So dynamics were, were naturally introduced by this piece of empirical evidence. And uh, in 1932, we had uh, the einstein de Sitter flat solution, which is just a, a universe filled with matter, um, but that's also uh, expanding, so the spatial part is expanding. So that's great. Uh, and that's, that was uh, very much favored, even up into the 80s, where inflation predicted that uh, we, we'd have a, a flat universe. Um, so you, just, you could just have matter content in this universe. And that's, that's great. 
uh, you have a nice time this is the universe and everything's fine. But uh, as things go, uh, there's always problems um, and the problems grew in the 90s. So at the beginning of the 90s, observations of uh, galaxy clusters were showing um, that the baryon to cold dark matter ratio was inconsistent with what we knew about how elements were generated in the early universe. And I take this quote from a, a paper in the early 90s where there was a bit of a crisis in cosmology because they say either the density of the universe is less than we require for closure, that means uh, that we require for uh, a flat universe, or there's uh, some problem in our standard inter interpretation of element abundances. This was also uh, shown in other observations of galaxy correlations, so correlations in the galaxy field, uh, where we see in this plot um, from a paper in the early 90s, uh, the black dots are the observation and the solid black line is an einstein sitter prediction. So there's clearly problems, right, in the 90s. And we want a flat universe, so we have something, some uh, matter density, omega matter that's less than one, and we want to close this somehow because we want a flat universe. So we're not really sure how to do that yet. Uh, there's some sort of lid, but we don't know what it is. Move forward 10 years, and then there's an even more famous result uh, by the two supernova teams, uh, Adam Rees and uh, Sol Pilmater, um, where they, they showed that, um, well, so they, they used supernovae. So over the 10 years between the early 90s and late 90s, supernovae uh, could become standardizable, and then they could be used as uh, standard candles, which would let us map out the expansion history of uh, the universe to very high redshift. And uh, so we could go back in time and trace how the universe was expanding with time uh, up until redshift one, which is a long, long time ago. And so what their analysis showed is that uh, the, the observations were super consistent uh, with a model which had uh, some matter density plus a constant energy density, um, which uh, which was I, I, there was probably no good ideas then, maybe not so many good ideas now either. But uh, dark energy, uh, as it was dubbed, um, and so we, we have this additional energy component, uh, which is causing the universe to the, ex the spatial expansion of the universe to accelerate. In fact, so this was their main finding. Great. Uh, or not so great. Um, this, this status quo has been maintained for the past 20 years um, and has just been improved um, with, with more precise measurements. So for example, the cosmic microwave background, which I show here, um, these measurements taken by the, the Planck satellite in 2018, but also precursors, WMAP, um, they also show that we have a universe where there's uh, about 30% uh, matter and 70% uh, some, some dark energy component, which is causing late time acceleration of the spatial part of our, our metric. Also confirmed by other observations, and I could go on listing many, many, but I don't have the time to, uh, but needless to say, there's a plethora of uh, empirical evidence supporting this cosmological model, or at least is consistent with it. And that has become the, the standard model of cosmology, fits all this, this data very well, uh, except for some mild tension. Um, and this is the standard model of uh, cosmology as we know it today. So it's super refined. Uh, we have super precise measurements. Um, the question is, what is this, this dark energy causing this, the spatial acceleration? And so we know this, this dark energy or something uh, is causing an accelerated expansion. And uh, from this review, uh, they, they combine various data sets um, and they show that there's a huge confidence for the existence of this, this um, energy, this dark energy. And so we know it's there, we know something is there. Uh, maybe we don't know how to explain it so well. Um, and we could probably classify it into various problems. Uh, let's say, Right, so, the, so we have this, this energy that is constant, it's non-dynamical. Um, it can have some dynamics, but uh, let's, let's say it's non-dynamical. And you can interpret that as the, the quantum vacuum energy of empty space, right? So um, 
we could we could do that. Uh, the problem is that the the prediction from quantum field theory is so much larger than the value we've measured using our our experiments, our cosmological experiments. And so, if you want to cancel these two values and and well, so you have a, yeah, so this gets a bit te uh, technical, but you have a QFT, a quantum field theory prediction. You have the observed value. And to, to reconcile the two, you could use a bare cosmological constant. But to, to get the agreement, you'd have to tune this bare constant to an insane uh, degree, which is a, a huge fine tune tuning problem. Uh, so there's a problem with doing that. Uh, but even if you, you do this fine tuning, um, well, let's say you don't do the fine tuning um, and you say, okay, the accelerated expansion is not due to the vacuum energy. You still have to answer the question, how does the quantum vacuum energy degravitate? So it doesn't couple to gravity and that's the old cosmological constant problem. And then separately, you have to also say, why is the universe uh, accelerating? So why do we have this, this residue um, with something that looks like a vacuum energy and where is it coming from? And so one thing you could also ask is, uh, could our underlying assumptions uh, in all these data comparisons be wrong? Um, so that's typically what you do when you run into problems, you have to go back and reanalyze your assumptions. You could say, okay, we've assumed that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic so the cosmological principle, maybe you could violate that a bit or you could uh, modify uh, general relativity, which is an underlying assumption of all these data comparisons. Um, and so after all that, we finally ask the question, why is cosmic large scale structure the next big step in this chronology? Um, and I'll tell you why. So, so we'll look at galaxy surveys, which are um, basically our observation they, they characterize our observation of the large scale structure. Um, and so in the past 30 years, we've had various galaxy surveys, which have mapped out the large scale structure of the universe. And there's been the Boss survey, the Kilo degree survey, among others. And they've observed you know, about a million to tens of millions of galaxies over some proportion of the sky, about a quarter for the Boss survey, 3% for kids. Again, everything was consistent with fantasy DM, uh, but maybe we need to look closer. So this is what's going to happen over the next 10 years. We have these advanced galaxy surveys coming online over the next 10 years. And if you can compare the two, you see that we're doing orders of magnitude more observations of galaxies. So what happens, right? If you are observe more galaxies, your observations become far more precise uh, statistically. And that means that even small deviations to, to um, your, your best fit model or your modeling uh, will, will show up in the data. You'll, you'll produce some tensions. And these could be hints for, for new physics or ways to go beyond the standard model and hints to solve the dark energy problem. So, so this is the point. Next 10 years, immense statistical error reduction and uh, far more comprehensive in terms of time and space. So we have a, large, a larger percentage of the sky also being covered and uh, a redshift range, which is far superior. Uh, the problem here is that if you increase, if you decrease your statistical errors, you want your theoretical modeling to follow. Uh, because if you have inaccurate theoretical models, you apply them to super accurate data, you're gonna get the wrong interpretation uh, and you're gonna get the wrong picture of, of nature. So that's the challenge, to get a theoretical model which can match the upcoming uh, data quality. And that leads us into the second part, which is a bit more technical now. So how do we do this? So let's start, what do we measure? When, when we think of galaxy surveys, right? We want to measure the large scale structure that's related to the cosmological model and gravity, right? So we look at the sky, we see galaxies, we see positions, right? So some angular position, we see shapes and we can also measure their redshift. Great. And we want to get there. So we start with some gravity model, some cosmological assumptions and uh, some general assumptions like homogeneity and isotropy. Okay. And these are encoded in the matter field uh, fluctuations or perturbations. 
right? So you have a, a matter field that's evolving over time in this cosmological model. Gravity is the main player uh, at these scales. So you can, you can map your gravity and cosmology onto matter field perturbation. Uh, this is an n-body shot, so a numerical simulation uh, showing these, these fluctuations in the matter field where you'd have like a red dot that would mean, you know, you'd have a high concentration of galaxies or a high matter concentration. Um, but this is the cold dark matter field, right? And we want to go to the galaxies. So these matter field perturbations are somehow mapped into the, the galaxy field. And this is a non-trivial problem, but it can be done. There's a, a question of bias. So the bias relates your matter field to your galaxy field. Uh, and then you have an additional problem because you don't know the in initial conditions of the universe, okay? So uh, because you don't know the initial conditions, things can't be treated deterministic, determinist, determinist, you know what I mean. So if things can't be determined, right? So if you have the initial conditions, you just trace everything forward and you get a prediction, but we don't know the initial conditions. So you have to treat everything statistically. So you look at this galaxy field and you want to model it uh, statistically, you want to to, um, to write down the statistics of the field. And you can compress these statistics into uh, correlation functions. So correlation functions then uh, are um, Fourier transforms. So for the sake of this talk, I'll be looking at the Fourier space correlation functions, which are called uh, power spectra or multiple multipoint spectra. So what are these multipoint spectra or the, the multipoint correlations? So you can, you can see them as uh, just, well, so let's, let's consider the two point statistics. So it's really a measure of how two points in this field are correlated as a function of separation. Uh, you can go higher, you can go to three point and four point correlations, correlators. But for the sake of this talk, we'll just be looking at the, the two point correlation. So it's called the power spectrum. And it's a function of K. So K is the wave mode. Uh, and it goes as inverse distance because we Fourier transform. And it's also a function of the redshift. Uh, but then you have higher order correlators, as I've said. Uh, and thankfully, I don't do that stuff anymore. I just concentrate on the, the power spectrum, which is far, far simpler to, to deal with. Okay, so the power spectrum. That's uh, the main quantity we'll be looking at. Uh, and how does that relate to um, the actual observables. So, so the story isn't finished yet, right? We need to do a bit more to get to the observables. So the main observables of galaxy surveys are uh, weak lensing, so galaxy weak lensing and galaxy clustering. So galaxy weak lensing um, is the effect of background galaxies on uh, the effect, sorry, of, of the matter distribution in the universe on the shapes of uh, background galaxies. So we see this picture of galaxies. Uh, these are some background galaxies at some redshift. The light from these galaxies is coming towards our telescopes. And as it does that, the light rays are bent because of the intervening matter distribution. And what that matter distribution does is it tends to distort the shapes of these galaxies. And from these distortions, we can create what are called shear maps. And so these shear maps, we can take them and then we can also construct uh, two point correlations with this shear map. And that gives us the, what are called the CLs. So it's the angular power spectrum of, uh, of uh, weak lensing. And what you can see here is the CL is a function of the source redshift, so the background galaxy redshift, and L. And L is a, a multiple, so it also scales as inverse distance because this is also uh, um, done in Fourier space. And what you notice is that the cosmic shear or, or weak lensing power spectrum is an integral from the source redshift to the present time, so to all the way to our telescopes, uh, with some kernel, so K of Z, and the power spectrum. So here we see the power spectrum we talked about earlier, how it translates into something that we can actually see uh, on the sky. Uh, and the relation between the wave mode and uh, the the multiple is, is basically a, uh, a proportionality relation, but it, it goes, but you have the proper distance here. 
And just to give you an idea, the lensing kernel peaks uh, at about, um, well, it depends on the source redshift, but uh, for, for example, for the, for one of the, the path surveys, kid survey, I believe it peaks at around redshift of 0.5. And that corresponds um, to a, well, we'll, we'll get to that. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll approach that a bit later. Okay, there's something else I won't be having time to talk about today, which is galaxy clustering. It's the other main observable of galaxy surveys. So I'll, I'll just skip that piece for now. One thing to keep in mind is that uh, the wave mode goes as inverse distance. So when I talk about small scales, I mean large K modes, okay? All right, so now we move to the matter power spectrum. How do we model this, this object? Uh, there are very various ways to model this object, um, given uh, a theory of gravity or cosmology. So remember, what I want to concentrate here on is going from some theory of gravity and cosmology to the observables. The main ingredient for these observables is the power spectrum. How do we go then from our theory of cosmology and gravity to the power spectrum? And there are various ways to do that. Uh, but in general, all these ways, what, what, what they do first is you, they perturb the matter density field. So you write down your matter density field as some background value plus some perturbation uh, delta, okay? Um, and then you want to solve for these, these fluctuations or these perturbations uh, using either numerical or analytic uh, methods. Okay, so you have, uh, you, can, you can write down some evolution equations for these, uh, these, these perturbations. And these evolution equations come from matter conservation, momentum conservation, but they involve naturally uh, a gravitational model and also the background expansion. So what goes into this is some Poisson equation generally, uh, which relates your gravitational potential to the matter fluctuation. Uh, F here is some, uh, some measure of your, your some measure of, um, the lack of knowledge of your gravi gravitational theory. So F is, uh, it could represent some modification to this Poisson equation. Now we'll keep it very general for now. And then you have your background expansion, so the Hubble expansion, H. And these both go into this, into solving these equations for your fluctuation. So this is how you go from gravity and cosmology to matter fluctuation. And then what you do once you've solved for these things is you can take the two points spatial correlation of the field, and that gives you your power spectrum. Great. So, so this is a, a sketch of how you would go from, uh, like I said, cosmology and gravity to the power spectrum. And then just to recap, at the end of the day, you plug that into your angular uh, cosmic shear power spectrum, and then you compare it to data, essentially. Uh, there are many other complications, but that's basically what we want to do. So there are some considerations for modeling this power spectrum. Um, you have to keep in mind that uh, better statistics are going to be had at small scales. So you're going to have more pairs of galaxies at small separations where the physics becomes messy. So the nonlinear regimes that I've been talking about. So you want to model nonlinear effects accurately. You also want to go beyond Consistency, consistency tests of lambda CDM. So from just a, a model comparison perspective, if we're always just testing lambda CDM, then we, we could find that it's always consistent, sure. But could there be better models that fit the data? Um, and in that sense, you'd want to go beyond uh, just consistency tests of lambda CDM. And that could offer hints of uh, solutions to these problems that we face in cosmology. In particular, you'd, you'd want to keep gravity quite general. So you don't want to rely on general relativity if you remember the assumptions I talked about earlier. And you want to allow for maybe some interaction in the dark sector or some evolution of dark energy. Another thing is uh, you also want to model additional physics. So um, these things I'll talk about at the end of the talk, uh, but I list them here. Um, but the, the last thing is that you want your predictions to be very fast. So you want some tools that can produce power spectra predictions for whatever model you're considering very fast, because at the end of the day, you're going to be comparing these to data in a statistical analysis. And for such analysis like um, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, 
uh, you need to do many, many model computations, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of model computations. So you need a tool that can do this super fast. Okay, so uh, we know how to go from cosmology and gravity to the power spectrum, and we have all these, these criteria that we need to keep in mind when we're modeling the power spectrum. Let's focus on, on these uh, two things for now. And what are the options that we have uh, that, that can um, fulfill these criteria that we, that we want, as well as being fast? So I'll take you through uh, some of the various modeling approaches people have determined for the, the power spectrum. So the first is uh, numerical methods, which we saw previously on, uh, on one of my slides. These basically solve the Poisson equation exactly. And uh, what they do is you have particles in the box, you solve the Poisson equation, you get the acceleration for the particles, and then you can perturb. And you do this in various time steps. So uh, starting from early times to uh, today. Um, and then once you have the particle distribution at the redshift that you want, you can go out and you can actually measure the correlations in uh, the, the particle field. This is great, it's super, um, super accurate because you're solving everything exactly uh, using numerics. Um, so the range of these models is super high. You can go down into the nonlinear regime uh, quite well with these models. They're also very flexible. So if you want to modify gravity, you just modify the Poisson equation that you're trying to solve in these, in these um, simulations. Problem is they're very computationally expensive. So they're not very well suited for uh, statistical analysis when you have to do hundreds of thousands of model computations. But there's a nice way to get around this. You could run some M-body simulation uh, for specific sets of cosmological parameters or gravitational parameters. And then you could, uh, you could create an M, what's called an emulator, which is a, a fancy way of saying an interpolator between the different parameters uh, that you've, you've ran your simulations for. And so these emulators, the benefit is that uh, they're super fast. So once you've constructed this emulator, once you've built this interpolation function, uh, it takes uh, fractions of a second to compute uh, a power spectrum. They're also super accurate because they're based on simulations and simulations are very accurate. There is some inaccuracy coming from this um, interpolation. I use this word very loosely. Uh, and flexibility is, on, is also um, a bit of an issue because they rely on the simulations that you, you've constructed them upon. So if you wanted to extend the parameter space, for example, you'd have to run new simulations. So they're not super flexible uh, in terms of the gravitational models or dark energy models that they can, they can accommodate. Uh, there are some analytic approaches that people consider. So for example, perturbation theory, when you treat the density perturbation as being very small. Um, these are analytic methods that solve the evolution equations for the perturbations uh, in an analytic way. Um, the problem here is that uh, because you're only treating uh, the density perturbation when it's small, then you can't go into the nonlinear regime. You can't go to scales where the density blows up and becomes uh, you know, close to one or even greater than one. They're very flexible though, because they, you, know, you just need to specify the evolution equations. It's very simple to do. And uh, they're, they're quite fast because of analytics. And then you also have the, the halo model. Um, so the halo model uh, assumes that all dark matter collapses to form uh, what are called halos, these bound objects. And um, I mean, in the standard uh, iteration of this, it's a spherical collapse. They're very fast um, because they're also analytic. Uh, they're also very flexible, so you can adopt the halo model to whatever uh, cosmology or gravitational model you have in mind, uh, in principle. Um, and the range is a bit better because they treat things nonlinearly. The problem here is that they need additional ingredients. So you need to specify, for example, the density um, profile of the halos. You need to specify um, their mass distribution. Um, so, so these things need to be specified um, with a high degree of accuracy if you want to maintain accuracy in the power spectrum prediction. So there's a caveat there. The one I'll be focusing on is a relatively new approach to, to modeling the, the power spectrum um, in beyond lambda CDM uh, theories, so beyond the standard model or including new physics. 
Um, and it consists of two pieces. So I'll be explaining this in a bit of detail. Um, your nonlinear power spectrum, so P of K, is equal to some correction. So this is the, the ansatz that we propose, uh, called the reaction. This is called the halo model reaction, times some nonlinear, what's called a pseudo power spectrum. Uh, and it's a bit subtle what this the pseudo power spectrum actually is. The pseudo power spectrum is basically a uh, standard nonlinear power spectrum, which you can get from, for example, uh, an emulator or some fitting function with standard lambda CDM physics included at the nonlinear scale. But the caveat here is that you want the linear clustering to match the target cosmology. So that's a, it's a bit of a, a subtle point, but uh, there are ways to construct the pseudo, the pseudo power spectrum. And the point of using the pseudo power spectrum is that it was found to uh, have a much better performance um, in general over lambda CDM, standard lambda CDM, nonlinear non -linear power spectrum in this setup. Uh, but that's a, that's a technical point. So maybe uh, if you have questions, we can go over that later. The second piece is called the reaction. And so this is basically uh, a correction to your nonlinear pseudo power spectrum, uh, which, is, which is adding in all the nonlinear physics from your beyond lambda CDM uh, cosmology or gravity. And it's essentially a ratio of halo model spectra uh, with a one loop correction, a one loop perturbation theory correction. Again, this is maybe a bit technical and because of time constraints, I, I might not get into this uh, very deeply, but if you're interested, I can definitely talk about it at the end. But this is the basic form of this reaction. So we have this KPT, which is a one loop perturbation theory correction. And these uh, one halo terms, so these two are um, coming from the halo model. So uh, like I said in the previous slides, these depend on the density profile, uh, the abundance of your halos, um, and, uh, and the concentration. So they depend on some ingredients that you need to specify. OK, so let's, uh, let's move on and see how this thing does. So um, I have compiled what I think is uh, this model's performance compared to the others. It's very fast. It's analytic. Uh, it's super flexible, so you can adopt it. You can uh, adapt it to any theory of gravity or dark energy that you like. And the range is actually surprisingly good. Uh, so it's got an extremely good range. Um, and just to give you a, an idea, so here's a plot of, um, of a ratio of power spectra. So this is a ratio of um, DGP, which is some beyond lambda CDM gravity model. It's a five dimensional theory to the power spectrum in GR. So it's a ratio divided by the same ratio from a numerical simulation. And so as I, show, as I told you before, our numerical simulations are the best guess we have at modeling large scale structures. So they are the benchmark and accuracy. So, we, so the closer these lines are to one, the more accurate the model is. I show it at three different redshifts and for four different uh, power spectrum modeling approaches. And uh, you have linear theory, you have one loop perturbation theory, uh, you have halo fit, which is based on the halo model, and then you have this halo model reaction. And what we can see is it, it outperforms the other approaches uh, quite well in this theory of gravity. Another point to make on this slide is that uh, we developed the code which can calculate this halo model reaction um, and it's super fast. So uh, as if you remember, the speed was a very important piece uh, if you want to do data theory and um, comparisons. And that's exactly what uh, some collaborators have done recently with the KID survey. So Tillman Truster um, and collaborators recently took the KIDS data. So KIDS was a, a large scale structure survey which was recently completed. Um, and he used the halo model reaction to, to constrain a, a theory of gravity uh, beyond Einstein's GR. Um, so also, yeah, so, so maybe I should also say in, in this paper, both of that, we also did forecast for the same theory of gravity. So I'll show both results and then I'll explain them. 
Okay. So on the left, we have the, the actual data comparison uh, for this f of r gravity. Um, so this is from kids. The, the parameter of this theory is uh, f of r naught. So it's over here. And what we can see is it's not constrained at all by the kids data. If we go to L max of 1,500, which roughly corresponds to a K of one, if we take the lensing kernel to peak at 0 0.5. Uh, our forecasts, on the other hand, for an LSST survey, so this is a next generation survey um, coming online soon, um, we see that we can constrain the model parameter to uh, far better, uh, well, we can constrain far better than the kids data allows us. And this is because the errors have shrunk dramatically with these upcoming surveys. The caveat is that we need to go down to these scales, so around K of one, at about 1% accuracy. Another thing to, to note is that if we go down to even smaller scales, so the 3000, we see that we don't gain much information. Uh, so aiming for about L of 1500 or an accuracy of 1% of K of one uh, is a nice benchmark to, to place on our power spectrum model. So finally, uh, we've talked about how we model the power spectrum. We've managed to do that quite well, um, but you know, there's, uh, so many things to think about because, uh, yeah, the job is never done basically. So you've managed to model the power spectrum accurately, but there are still other things you need to think about if you want to achieve this 1% uh, accuracy. And what are these things? So I showed them briefly on this slide, which I, I had before. Um, we've done all those things, uh, but there's still uh, some other things that we need to take care of. So there are other physical phenomena happening at the small scales. Things get extremely messy. And if you want to extract your cosmology, you're going to have to have a very good handle on uh, additional physics. So in particular, the main players would become massive neutrino effects and also baryonic physics. So for example, um, supernovae ejecting dust um, or, H or active galactic nuclei also ejecting uh, things and things become super, super messy. Um, but how messy at the level of the power spectrum? So that's been studied um, in detail. So I'm going to show you two results uh, from Schneider et al, Lagurge et al. Um, and they, they highlight the importance of modeling um, these effects at small scales. So if we start with the baryonic effects, we can take a look at this plot. And it's basically a ratio of the power spectrum with baryonic effects to the power spectrum without baryonic effects from simulations. And what we see is that if we go down to K of one, so if you remind, remind us as we want to get to 1% of K of one, these effects are almost 30% if you take the most extreme example. So you really need to, to account for baryonic effects if you're going to model everything with 1% accuracy. Similarly for massive neutrinos, so here's another plot. It's, uh, again, the, the power spectrum with massive neutrinos to a massless neutrino case. And we see at K of one, we also get super large effects depending on the neutrino mass, of course. Uh, this plot shows various neutrino masses from 0.046 and up to 0.46 electron volt. Okay, so it's important to do these things. So the, the next thing we can ask ourselves, okay, well, so we want to model these additional effects, but we also want to model gravity and dark energy agnostic. Uh, so do these things communicate with each other? Do we need, can we model them separately and just pack everything onto the power spectrum? And the answer is uh, sort of. So if we look at this plot uh, by, from Midatal 2016, uh, we see various lines, okay? Um, which is, and these are ratios of the, the modified power spectrum to a lambda CDM power spectrum. The solid curves are when you properly account for both these effects. So there's communication between these effects and you do a proper modeling or you treat them separately, which is the dashed cases. And what you want to look at is the difference between the solids and the dashed. And if we look at uh, the red and the green, which are um, baryons and neutrinos or baryons and modified gravity, we see that they're pretty much independent. But things become uh, more complicated when you look at mass modified gravity and neutrinos. And they seem to be, uh, in, uh, dependent on each other. So you need to properly model the two. And that's what we did uh, this year. Um, well, okay, so this is a, 
Well, so Matteo Cataneo did this for massive neutrinos without modified gravity in 2019. Um, so what he did is he uh, added in the massive neutrinos linearly to the halo model reaction. Um, and uh, what you get essentially is this modified version of the halo model reaction. Uh, what it is, is it's a linear combination of the massive neutrino spectrum FV is the fraction of total matter in neutrinos uh, to the total matter. So you have the linear addition of, uh, massive, of the massive neutrino spectrum, but also the halo model um, called dark matter plus variant spectrum. And they're being added uh, as a weighted sum. Uh, they're being combined as a weighted sum, um, which has been shown to be a very good uh, approximation for, uh, for adding in the effects of massive neutrinos. Uh, and we extended this to the modified gravity and modified um, dark sector um, scenario. Here I give a, a brief overview of the accuracy of this extended modeling. So including massive neutrinos now, uh, we considered some models here, uh, which are beyond lambda CDM. Uh, and if we look at the K of one case, uh, we get around 2% accuracy for most of these so there's still some work to do, but uh, we're almost there if we want to look at the 1%. Um, ben, you have roughly five minutes. Okay, thanks. Uh, and just to say, these are these are competitive with current state-of-the-art nonlinear methods um, in beyond lambda CDM cosmologies down to K of one. Uh, the advantage here is that we're we have a very uh, flexible framework to accommodate new theories uh, of gravity or dark energy. Uh, I'm going to start summarizing with the sources of inaccuracy, uh, and if I have time, I'll do some machine learning, I have machine learning slides. Uh, so, so the sources of inaccuracy are mainly the pseudo spectrum. Uh, currently, we've been using an HM code 2020 um, fitting function, which is about 2.5% uh, accurate down to K of 10. So we, we showed you 2% uh, results. A large amount of that 2% is coming from the HM code inaccuracy. So if you improve the pseudo spectrum, you will improve the accuracy of this procedure. Again, I told you the halo model assumes various ingredients. Uh, these were taking lambda CDM fit. Um, and so above K of three, the error budget starts to be pushed into the halo model reaction itself because of these faulty or inaccurate ingredients. And also there's some communication between baryonic effects and modified gravity, which uh, you'd have to model uh, correctly. Okay, so maybe if I have three minutes left, I'll, I'll do these last three slides, which is a fun extension uh, we did from this reaction code. Um, so what I usually do for these slides is I ask the audience um, if they can identify which of these two photos is uh, three slices of bacon. And which is my uh, longtime collaborator, Alcistis Portugu. And people usually say it's the one on the right, which is correct. Yeah, so that's Bacon and that's uh, Alcistis. But what if I told you, could you do the same thing with these power spectra? So remember, power spectra is a, a function of scale, k. Here we take log k and redshift. And can you tell me which one is lambda CDM and which one is modified gravity? And in this case, uh, people take a wild guess, so 50% of the people get it right. Uh, but we don't. We want to do much better than 50%, of course. So the one on the left is f of r. And how do we do that? So uh, obviously, where this is going, I've already given it away. This is going into uh, the regime of machine learning. So we've constructed this Bayesian cosmological network, which we've called Bacon. Uh, with, we've output many hundreds of thousands of spectra from uh, React, this code, which computes the halo model reaction. Uh, in these scale and redshift ranges, uh, we've considered five different classes of theories, the so lambda CDM, evolving dark energy, uh, the DGP model, an F of R model, and uh, some random spectrum with some random uh, fluctuations in it. Uh, we've added some stage four, so some next generation galaxy survey like noise to these spectra. And uh, we've put it through the network, we've trained the network, and we get about a 96% accuracy uh, of it classifying a spectra as being lambda CDM or F of R or DGP. Um, so there's some subtle details with that. And this, this final talk I'll be showing before the, the last slide is um, just how well we can predict 
if a spectrum is f of r or not. f of r is taken as some generic case of modified gravity in this in this scenario. So we can predict with with quite high confidence uh, down to the f of r naught of 10 to the minus 7, which if you remember from the forecast previously was as good as a as um, a next generation survey analysis going to uh, multiples of 1,500. Okay, ongoing and next steps. This is the last slide. So what's next? Um, I've considered specific theories of gravity so far, but we want to consider general theories of gravity and we want to parameterize them somehow. So, so this is something we're thinking about. Uh, we don't want to constrain model by, model by model. We want to do a general analysis for any possible deviation from lambda CDM. We want to develop accurate pseudo quantities to get down to that 1%. Uh, we want to develop a model for galaxy clustering, which was the other uh, observable of galaxy surveys, uh, main observable. And we also want to train this, this code bacon on the actual observables themselves, not the power spectrum. And then actually maybe apply it to data and see what uh, it tells us if the power spectrum is showing hints of new physics or not as a first indication, and then go out and do our, our full statistical analysis. Okay, uh, that's it. And uh, sorry for going a bit over time, but uh, yeah, thanks for listening to me ramble on for 45 minutes. Okay, thanks for the very pedagogical talk and uh, great slides. Um, so if people have questions as usual, uh, just raise your hand using the chat. Um, if no one has a question straight away, I will, I will start with my own questions. Okay, let's see. So maybe I can get started. And I have a bunch of silly questions, actually, because this is not... Oh, okay, so maybe you can start with Irania, uh, and then they can come back to me later. No, no, you go ahead. Yeah. I'll ask next. Okay, so I have a bunch of silly questions because this is not really my field, uh, so, so bear with me. So the first one is like, you start motivating your talk by saying that those next surveys are going to be quite relevant uh, for maybe um, you know finding out new physics or maybe to elucidating the nature of like dark energy and stuff like that. Um, one thing that sometimes I feel concerned about is uh, what if something similar to particle physics happens, where the LHC was built up just to further confirm this other model of particle physics. If that would be the case. Um, what do you think will happen? Like, where should we look at to uh, maybe unfold more about, you know, cos cosmology or, or, or nature of gravity or dark, ener dark energy, dark matter and stuff like that? So yeah. this would be like, I guess, the, the pessimistic scenario about what's, uh, what's coming next. If I'm completely honest with myself, I don't expect any new physics. Yeah. Ourselves, right. Okay. But who knows? You can always be an optimist. Uh, but to answer your question, I think it's it's uh, pretty clear that gravitational waves are the next frontier, and uh, yeah, that will be you know after these large scale structure surveys are are done and retired, uh, I think there's still a lot of things to be done in the, the gravitational waves arena. Of course, it's in its infancy, so uh, yeah, that will give us new clues, um, and hopefully that will stimulate someone's imagination. And, and so we're always looking, sorry. Or go ahead. I, I, just, I was going to say, we're always looking for tensions, right? I mean, so if we just do consistency tests, we're, we're always looking for tensions, and then that sort of motivates a uh, new direction. Yeah. Um, but it would also be interesting if we compare, you know, beyond lambda CDM models, and we see that there's a preference for a non lambda CDM model, and then that would uh, de facto be the next, should be the next uh, standard cosmolog cosmological model. Sure. Thanks. So even even just to stop hearing lambda CDN in every cosmology talk, I think it's worth uh, doing this sort of this sort of work. Right. Hmm. Um, Irania. Uh, thanks. I, I have a related, more philosophical question, and then a technical question. So the philosophical question is like kind of the opposite of what what uh, Guillermo asked. So. Um, you started by motivating all of these different models being modeled by saying that we shouldn't just keep testing consistency checks of lambda CDM. But lambda CDM, let's remember, has three ingredients which are not in the standard model of particle physics. Um, and so it's a phenomenological model. And to me, it seems that actually the most 
compelling thing to do is to keep stress testing it very, in very great detail. And uh, eventually it'll break because it is phenomenological after all. And in the meantime, there's a lot of effort going into developing uh, observables for many, many epicycles, which are added onto Lambda CDM. And uh, that's a lot of human effort, right? So what, what's your kind of more philosophical view about those two types of work that's going on in the field? Okay. Well, so I would say 80% of the effort is being, in, is, is being devoted to Lambda CDM nonlinear models. So people are really trying to stress test the model with the next generation of service. Uh, that's like the main goal. Then, you know, you have also people developing, uh, like myself, um, these beyond Lambda CDM alternatives. Um, so yeah, you do want to stress test the model. You do want to uncover tensions. Uh, at the moment, you know, there's the Hubble tension, there's the Sigma-8 tension. The Sigma-8 tension has the potential of also developing to uh, become a, a real tension with these large scale structure surveys. And then that maybe that could tell us something uh, as well. So that, I think that was the, the first part, right? So why aren't we devoting more effort into stress tests? And I think people are, I think that's uh, what they really want to do with these, these next, generation of, next generation surveys. Uh, but the second, can you repeat the second one? The second part of the... I haven't asked the second one yet. Yes, of, ah, of course, ah. I know people are stress testing Lambda CDM. Yeah. I was just more wondering whether you think that uh, the, the greater effort put into the more add-on types of Lambda CDM models, not the neutrinos. We know neutrinos have mass. Yeah. So obviously that, that's worth effort into. But many of the other extensions are phenomenologically motivated in themselves. They're not fundamental theories uh, of the universe. Yeah. So, um, so, so, okay, in, in relation to that, when you modify gravity, for example, as you say here, uh, you know, um, the, the baryonic effects uh, can be quite significant if you really want to push deep into the, the nonlinear regime, uh, that becomes, that modeling then becomes extremely important. And so do you feel any concern regarding the fact that those models are not as well developed in the galaxy formation sense as uh, the effort that's going into Lambda CDM? I see, okay. Yeah, um, that is definitely a, a good point. Um, well, what I, I feel many people hope is that the flexibility that you give to these baryonic uh, emulators, as they're called, is enough to accommodate strange new physics, right? So if you have some nuisance parameter in there, you're hoping to absorb any interaction between the modified gravity or the and the baryons. I, I think that's the hope. As far as, um, yeah, I, and I think that's probably the best we can do, because beyond that, you'd have to choose a model, you'd have to run hydrodynamical simulations, You'd have to see if your modeling stands up to that or does an emulator around that. And uh, then you'd have to do that for any other model that you want. So it's like, it's a, uh, you, feasibly you can't, you can't do that. So what we do is we build emulators that are flexible enough. So for example, Earl Schneider uh, built an emulator that's able to match the different behaviors of all the hydrodynamical simulations that you saw, or at, to some extent. Um, and so that, that should capture um, any strange physics that you should have. Um, and then like subtle, subtle signals of modified gravity, I think they would be yeah, lost on those scales uh, largely if you have large baryonic effects. Uh, it depends on, on various degeneracies, right? Yeah, so it's, it's not 100% clear. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Yeah, no problem. I have another silly question, actually. Mm -hmm. So it sometimes feels uh, to me that uh, a lot of those approaches, they are somehow like bottom up, right? So you start with like a sort of well-defined background and you talk about perturbations. Um, but I, I wonder, and I guess uh, Irania's question is also related to that, right? So people also have been trying to do a like, more top-down approach where you start with, I guess, just like understanding better um, structure formation at the level of like astrophysics and then trying to maybe coarse grain out the way to cosmology. 
um, are, are you familiar with like more this kind of like approach as opposed to the, the, the things that we do usually in cosmology? So yeah, but when you, okay, so maybe I'm not so familiar with how, how you would go about modeling the astrophysics if you don't start from a fundamental model. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 that's why I think that's, it's somehow a silly question, but it just feels to me that usually when we write down, like, you know, the, the delta when you are perturbing the energy density, it just feels like it, there is always this notion of perturbing some sort of like background that we're, we understand. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. more like IR towards UV approach. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I wonder if there is a more, let's say, quote, first principle approach where you rely on a, some sort of, sort of UV and you then seek coarse graining as opposed to I uh, see. the background. But maybe, maybe that doesn't make any sense. Maybe that's my uh, more high energy oriented way of thinking that doesn't quite apply here. Yeah, I don't know. Just intuitively, I would find that it would be much, much harder yeah. to do. Um, and I guess that's what yeah. people do simulations, I suppose, and stuff like that, right? Um, because you don't but have analytics. Even in the simulations, they, right, they go from uh, some cosmological model, they derive the, you know, they perturb the background. Uh, they have particles, and then they just use uh, this this modified Poisson equation to to move the particles around, and then they measure what they they get. Right. I don't think they're yeah they're not really start well, with hydrodynamical simulations. I'm not too sure how they would model how they they go about modeling that. I have a fluid dynamics. Yeah. So if you had a modified, yeah. For, and, and maybe my last question is back to this uh, approach that you have introduced using, I guess, machine learning to mm -hmm. model the, the power spectrum. Like how general is that also to be applied in other contexts? For instance, if there is a gravitational uh, wave uh, power spectrum uh, that we also expect to observe at some point, could that also be used to, to model the power spectrum or, or, or even like um, associate with like, yeah, other phenomena in general? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, as long as you have the training data set, then you can train it to do whatever you want, basically. Yeah. Yeah. But you need some tool which is able to generate. I think that was the key point here is that you needed a tool to generate this training data set. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so the code that we, we developed was exactly that. We could produce hundreds of thousands of spectra, right? And that's what mm -hmm. it needed. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't see any other question, so um, I guess we can end here. So thanks again for the for your time and for uh, giving this very nice talk. And thank you, a pleasure. Yeah, thank everyone also for joining. In. So see you guys uh, next week probably. Okay, bye bye. Bye everyone. See ya. See ya.